Hi, my name's Elijah, and welcome to my podcast, Songwriting for Songwriters. This week, my special guest is Ron Sexsmith. Ron is one of the world's most respected living songwriters. Canadian-born and three-time Juno award-winning songwriter, Ron has a natural gift for melody. He's just released his 18th studio album, The Vivian Line. We sat down and spoke about the influences and themes that gave birth to the songs on his new album. Ron told us about the beautiful story about how he decided to become a songwriter. He gave us some of the lowdown behind some of his most famous songs. He spoke about his influences and how he writes songs and his relationship with the songwriting muse. So please enjoy this podcast and uh, the wonderful music and conversation of Ron Sexsmith. Ron, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I just got home from America, so I'm a little shell shocked. You know, I made so many shows and uh, I haven't toured this much since pre-pandemic. You know, so how is it to be uh, back again playing after the pandemic? Well, it's. I mean, it's great. You know, I mean, it's nice to see people again. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I'm older and it's not as much fun as it used to be. You know, I mean, I still love performing, but the traveling. Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty exhausting, and uh, yeah. But you know, I'm I'm just really pleasantly surprised at how how it all went. You know, it went very. You know, I, I don't generally do that well in America, but I was pretty happy with the turnout and with how all the shows went. Yeah, fantastic. Now we um, you won't remember this, but I actually met you once in London and back in like 2007. We my band at the time we were recording in a studio. And I think you were over talking to some record company people and we randomly met in a bar for a couple of hours. And I was a huge fan of uh, Retriever and, um, oh. and uh, oh God, I can't remember the name of the single now off the top of my head. Not oh, about to lose, the... not about oh, not to lose. Yeah. And so we were talking in a bar and I was, I was singing, singing it to you and uh, we had a <laughs> lov- lovely evening. So it's yeah. nice to, 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 to be talking to you again. And obviously over the last few days, I've been listening to um, all your work and, you know, I f- fell back in love with um, Not About To Lose and that album Retriever. Um, but all your stuff, I mean, it's such a remarkable listen to go from your first album right the way through to the Vivian line. So I'm really interested to know um, what themes or what circumstances gave birth to these fantastic new sets of uh, songs that make up the Vivian line. Um, well, they kind of came out of the blue. You know, I mean, I had a record uh, called Hermitage that came out in 2020. Yeah. You know, during right, right as the COVID was just beginning, and I hadn't really been writing at all, after, you know, and um, and then early, I guess, 2021, I just sort of got a this sort of avalanche of songs, um, just from. I mean, I, I walk generally uh, every day, and that's that's how I tend to uh, come up with tunes. You know, I'll get these melodies in my head and. And then I start to realize that I'm in the middle of a new batch of songs. And and that's kind of what happened. But I, I wasn't really looking to make another album. Um, and I didn't even know if the label wanted another album. So it just all sort of came together. But um, I think it's a bit of an extension, you know, my last record in terms of, you know, it, it's just singing about this new place in yeah. life, you know, that if this... Uh, you know, we're a lot more happy here in, in this little town than we were in Toronto. So I think, uh, although, I mean, this record's probably a little more uh, uh, wistful than the, la- the last record. You okay. know, where, um, So, yeah, I mean, it's always hard to put your finger on exactly, you know, where the songs, you know, why they're coming or, or you know. Do you, do, you, do you have like a, a, a similar thing for me in a way where songs arrive and sometimes they arrive because you sit down with the guitar and play and sometimes they just turn up as melodies in your head or lines in your head you know it's one of those things which is quite an elusive thing and you've just mentioned that you tend to work every day so do, do you do you have like a technique or a habit or a process when writing songs or is it just a random thing which can come from anywhere and and everywhere yeah i mean i i like i say i tend to write when i'm when i'm out walking or okay. when i'm doing, when i'm doing something that is not too uh you know, doesn't require a lot of, con- you know, you know, if I'm yeah. cutting the grass or something, you know. Yeah, and I, I wrote a lot of the songs like on my first couple albums when I was working as a, a courier in Toronto. 
Fantastic. And so, you know, um, I, I, I very rarely pick up the guitar or, or try to write a song. It's, it's, yeah. that's usually the last thing I do once I have a song yeah. kind of in the works, you know, and sometimes it may be just one line and a, with a melody, um, or I'll sit at the piano you know, every now and then I'll stumble upon a chord progression, but, but generally it's usually, um, there's an idea first, of and whatever instrument is closer to me is what the one I'll sort of, you know, pick up. And uh, but yeah, and I'm just always amazed that they keep coming because every time I finish a batch, I think, well, maybe this is it, you know. So. Sure. So do you, do you find that the melodies like sing their way into your head? Are they just floating around without actually picking up an instrument? They just they arrive. Yeah, I mean, melody's the easy part for me, you sure. know. Um, I because I hum to myself and. Um, you know, I mean, I get them in my sleep sometimes. So, I mean, it's like, um, it's a, it's kind of a, I don't know, it's like a mystical thing or whatever. Yeah. And, and I grew up, I was very lucky, I think, to grow up in a very melodic age of music, yeah. you know, as a kid. I mean, you wouldn't hear a song on the radio if it didn't have a decent melody. That's true. And, and all that sort of worked itself into my DNA. Uh, even my favorite R&B music is melodic, you know, like the yeah. stuff that, you know, Smokey Robinson is doing or Sam Cooke and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it's, it's just, um, but, but I, at the same time, I want the lyrics to be, um, you know, I want them it to be as strong, you know, as the melody and vice versa. I want it to be kind of the seamless thing. Not that every song has to be some, you know, serious lyric or, or heavy lyric, you know, but yeah. you, you want, you just really want it to, to, kind of work hand in hand with the with the tune and you know sometimes i'll write a, a you know a ditty or something you know kind of a song that's a bit frivolous because on in the course of an of an album you know it's like a movie you know you want some lighter moments you want you know what i mean so i'm not a snob about it I, I, whatever idea i come even if it seems kind of dumb I'll, I'll work at it and i'll try to finish it you know? fantastic i mean that's quite of a similar process to me in a sense that i, I tend to maybe i start with a bit of music like a riff or some chords and then i do i tend to run a lot and walk a lot too and a lot yeah. of my songwriting has also come about through just having that music or that melody go round and round my head and as i'm running or walking you know i find that full verses will just come through as i'm doing something else like you said like running or, or walking and um it's sort of i personally that's the most exciting thing thing for me as a songwriter is that there is this kind of otherworldly mystery mysterious type of i don't know force or muse which you know you you are writing it because you're making decisions but my experience is, tends to be that it's just almost like it's coming through or something or i don't know if it's channeling or whatever but it seems to me that you have a similar experience that these arrive or they turn up in your head and what what do you do you do you think there is such a force as the muse do you think that is the muse or do you think it's just a kind of gift you have or how would you try to explain that to people that uh, maybe don't have that experience yeah it, it's hard to explain I mean there's there's a lot of I'm not very good at anything else you know so I was just really lucky when I found you know because I always loved to sing but I didn't know that I could write songs till I was like about 21 okay and then I all of a sudden I found myself you know because I'd read so many interviews with songwriters and rock stars and stuff yeah. and and then, you know, they would talk about the similar thing about how these ideas just came and and that hadn't really happened to me until I was about 21. Okay. And I was experiencing it for myself, you know. Wow. And I think a lot of it is like, you know, you're living your life and things are happening and you're going through different phases. Sometimes there's a huge upheaval, upheaval of some sort in your mm -hmm. life. And um and I think a lot of that in terms of my last two records was moving out of Toronto that it was such a huge shift for me sure. and that, and that just by nature, you know, it's going to, uh, you know, put these thoughts in your head and, um, and I, I guess that's more of lyrical ideas, you know, yeah. but, yeah. but still, um, you know, walking along, like I walked along the river now in Toronto, there wasn't a river, you know I mean? I could just, I was walking by cars and, it was it was a whole different vibe, and I have like, you know, bunnies in our yard. It feels very, it's just more peaceful or something. So I think that's reflected in the music. But I mean, yeah, I mean, getting back to your question, it's hard, you know, 
because sometimes I'll just get a, it's just a tiny little fragment I'll get, yeah, you know, and it and and that's all I have for maybe six months sometimes, and I keep singing it over and over, yeah, and and then and and, and then you kind of have a breakthrough where all of a sudden all the rest of the words come through, and and I I, I it's just about I guess our job is to recognize the potential in an idea whenever we get it, whatever it is. Yeah. And to keep returning to it and do and do the work, you know, because there is there's a tiny little bit of inspiration. And then that's when the the yeah. craft or whatever. Comes yeah, that's in. when all, all the, the hard work starts, right? The hard work, the relatively hard work. So with your move, um, clearly that's actually a, I spoke out to a couple of people that are fans of yours, actually, and um, asked if anybody had a had a question. And one of the questions that came up was, how has your move to the country um impacted uh your songwriting and uh so how how has it done that um i i think again it just it's a i never really lived around uh, you know nature before and okay. i'm not even really in the country i'm in a small town that's surrounded by the country yeah. but you know we have a uh it, it, you know we, i never really noticed birds before in toronto you know and i'm okay. here Everywhere I go, I mean, we have an owl that lives on our property. I walk mm -hmm. along the river and there's swans. And, you know, it's it's like, uh, it's very, um, it's just a different thing that, um, you know, I don't know, just, and also I'm a little older. I think Colleen and I, we've been through a lot and we're at this new phase where we feel happier and more together in a way. And, um, and all that kind of stuff, I think, I think, a lot of the anxiety I had from living in Toronto sure. the last bunch of years, the last decade, yeah. kind of just sort of evaporated. Yeah. And I just found myself writing all these uh, in a more of a kind of romantic place or something. Sure. I don't know. Because um, I think even if you listen to some of my later albums before I moved, they were, you know, like Long Pair Late Bloomer was probably my most successful album, but the lyrics are all kind of grumpy. You know, if you look at the lyrics, they're sure, sure, disillusioned sure. and all that. And uh, and that's probably the case a little bit for the next, the following album too. But so I don't know. I just found myself, um, you know, when I first moved here, I didn't know anybody. I spent a lot of time kind of alone. Okay. And I, I even wrote a musical during that time. Oh, you know? wow. So I was, okay. I was in this real you know writing frenzy in a way um and uh, in a way that i hadn't been since my first couple albums you know? okay so, yeah, yeah sure and that 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 coincided with you moving the, the writing the musical was around that time too yeah yeah i mean i'm still trying to get it off the ground i mean i have i wrote a book and i wrote then i wrote a musical based on the book um i mean I, even my twitter account is a form of writing for me because yeah. i do jokes i do sketches I do Twitter poems. Um, I'm kind of like, you know, I feel sometimes like I'm writing in human form or something, you know I mean? I like, I love all aspects of it, you know? True. I think, I mean, I went to art college and one of the things they uh, really drilled into us at art college was like, you're if you're going to be an artist, whatever discipline that is, you kind of have to commit your entire life and being to making art all the time. So if you're seeing the barn owl or the swan or you're walking or you're, even if you're tweeting, on social media that it is an opportunity to be artistic or to write you know and so you kind of you are constantly being an artist at all times you know that's what was drilled into me as a sort of uh background so i think yeah. i think you're right I've, i was on your twitter last night and it is and it was funny and there's some well-written tweets and it made me think and that's that you know it's another way in isn't it to your mind as an artist well yeah and i've tried to make it i mean you know i don't know if my the tweets are any good or anything i mean it's just like i always like the groucho marks and people like that so yeah. i'll just come up with these puns because i think twitter is actually a pretty it can be a pretty horrible place you know pretty yeah. nasty and judgmental and i've tried to make my twitter feed kind of a, a fun place where i'm interacting with people because yeah. i don't really do any other social media i don't do facebook or anything so this is this place I've created a world, but it's all writing. And, and I'll, also I, I'll show people what album I'm listening to, yeah. or I do, I upload uh, videos from my YouTube channel where I've done a, probably about 2000 cover songs over the years. Oh, cool. you know? cool. Like if it's somebody's birthday, like the other day it was 
Henry Mancini's birthday. So I uploaded a song from a few years ago. So, I mean, it, it's just, it's almost like my own little variety show, Twitter, yeah, 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 yeah. where I do jokes and songs and, you know. Things. Well, I, I, I really enjoyed it. I went on there and just, that's what I got from it. It was like, well, here's, here's Ron sharing himself with, you know, and it's, you know, you yeah. get that thing, I guess, sometimes of social media, it sometimes feels like you've got to be a master at, you know, the social media game but for me that's it's such a kind of it gets in the way of being creative so it was really good to see your feed and just see well here's someone who's just being himself and being creative and that yeah. i think that's really like what the best use of social media is for an artist is to almost think of it as a different platform of expressing so yeah i mean if it was getting in the way of my songwriting i would probably have to get off it but it's just all it's all part of the same thing in a way it's just an extension absolutely yeah. So what's the moment when, when you, you talk about, um you know, it's the experience of songs starting to arrive when you were 21, was, was there a moment or a kind of set of circumstances which made you decide to be a songwriter and to commit your, commit your life to being one? I really think it had to do with uh, my son being born because, okay. um, I mean, I was trying to write songs as a teenager and I had bands that the songs weren't really any good. Okay. I mean, I didn't have anything to say, I guess. Uh, 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 you know, and I was... It was more of a rock band kind of thing. Um, but when I, I was a young father, you know, as a dad at 21. Yeah, same here. Yeah. I had the same experience. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? No, yeah. I, it's just, it was such a, I didn't see it coming. You know, I mean, we were just, I didn't, you know, we barely even knew each other. We were tree planting north, way up in North Ontario. And when it happened and I, and it was this, you know, it was, it was pretty emotional because, um, I didn't know if I was ready to be a dad and yeah. and all this kind of stuff. And so when I finally moved to Quebec where she lived to, to have a go, yeah. um, that we were living in a barn, literally a barn that was being converted into a house with wood, wood stove. I was chopping wood, and, but they had a piano there and I didn't mm -hmm. really know how to play the piano, but, um, but all of a sudden I, my, I remember my son was um, a few weeks old, lying on its on a blanket and he was making all these noises and and that's when i wrote um you know my my former partner said he's speaking with the angel you know it was like a nice. french expression i guess yeah. and that was like my first song and i sat at the piano and i wrote it and and i just found in, in, during that whole period i i think i maybe i wrote like 26 27 songs Okay, well. And that had never happened before. And that was when I decided, I remember saying, I think I'm a songwriter. I think, because I didn't know what to do really before that. And I thought maybe we should move to the big city and I'll try this. Maybe I could do this. Cool. And, but it was really amazing to feel use, pretty useless most of my life. And all of a sudden to find this one thing yeah. that gave me sort of a direction, you know. That's beautiful, and that's such a beautiful song of yours as well. Um, one of my favorites, and what a what a blessing to sort of have found your gift and life choice through through the birth of your son. I mean, that's such a beautiful story. I think also I have to credit to at that very at the same time, like I'd always loved English music or you know the Brit like Kinks and all that kind of stuff, or the British music I should say. Sure. And um. And around that time, I was finally getting around to listening to my own countrymen. You know, all of a sudden, I was really into Gordon Lightfoot, yeah. really into Leonard Cohen for the first time, yeah. and and that had a huge influence as well because it sort of, I I knew I didn't really I didn't have what it what it took to be like a a rock and roll guy jumping around all over the stage. And when I saw Leonard and Gordon, they were kind of making the kind of music I felt. Well, I could do that, you know, I could, you know, music you could sort of grow old gracefully doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they were saying something, you know. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, and for a while, I even wondered, is it still okay to like the Kinks or Harry Nilsson? And, then, you know, I, I got over that pretty quickly and realized, oh, well, they're, it's all great. You know, they're just coming from different places. And, but um, it just, when I really got obsessed with all that, like Joni and all those people, and I think that's where I found my sound because it's, a hybrid of the Canadian sort of folk music yeah. and mixed with the sort of the, the melodic, the British music. And, That's really interesting because I can really yeah. hear that in your, in your work actually. It's, it's like an interesting perspective, the Canadian songwriting perspective, because, you know, like Leonard and uh, Gordon and Joni and Neil, 
and yourself there's there is like a um it is different to american songwriters and british songwriters there's a, there's a slightly different i don't know what, what i'm how to yeah. describe it but there's a slightly like main maybe i would use the word like elusiveness like a kind of slightly elusive take somehow you know that's what i get from your music not like you know it's also direct and you're telling us what you feel but there's just a slight step back and i don't know if that's like uh well i, I think i think um it is hard to put your finger on but it is um you know we're in between these two really dominant sort of cultures i mean we're a yeah. common country but then we're our next door neighbors are these really boisterous yeah. you know this loud country and yeah. we're sort of like um and somewhere you know and american music has got all that root stuff yeah and and but then we have all that sort of you know we used to have to sing god save the queen at school over here you know when i was a kid okay. and there was and i remember really liking the melody of that song as a kid you know and sure. um so it was sort of that and, you know when you hear a neil young record or something you know even if he's playing a country song yeah. you know you can tell that he's not from the south you know he's not he's got a different melody you know different Absolutely. accent yeah. a different take on it yeah and and so when i got my record deal and i was on my little you know on my journey here um i i was very aware of the you know very proud of the canadian songwriting legacy and it was yeah. something that i wanted to try and uphold um and you do what one and do i you think you i mean i i i I tried to, and, and uh, you know, I've had other Canadian songwriters that came up around the same time who've had more success and wh whatever, but all I know is when I when I first got out into the world and overseas, you know, people would always ask me, what is it about Canada that produces all these songwriters? But, I mean, look at all the great songwriters from England or from, you know what I mean? Like, it's it's just, or America. I mean, I love Dylan, Randy Newman, yeah. Warren Zeeb, and all these guys. So they've all had such a profound influence on me, but it's just, you know, I'm just, I'm from Canada and it's a different, it's a, it's a, you know, we're not as in your face as America. We're, we're not as, you know, a lot of uh, British music sometimes can be very, uh, you know, ironic and all this kind of yeah. stuff. You know, we're a little less so, it's a yeah. little more direct in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but all those all those elements, I I try to put in. I don't even try to put in my music. Just just, we're yeah. just in. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very really wonderful. Because I mean, I've found myself really in the last few years. I mean, Journey Mitchell was always a huge influence on. But I found myself getting into Neil Young later into life. But when when he gets under your skin and that kind of, if you like that Canadian perspective, it really is a very different kind of uh, viewpoint and and one which you have through your music, where it's it's you know these these melodies they kind of come and haunt you at night and they stick with you all day but they're not but like you say they're not they're not like shouting at you they're kind of just walking with you you know and that's how i feel about when i listen to your songs I'm, i've got like a friend which is a melody which is like walking with me and that's that's oh, a right. beautiful that's a beautiful thing thanks i mean yeah i've my music is probably why i haven't had maybe as much success as some other songwriters because it's it's not doesn't really hit you over the head you know it's sort of you have to kind of it's sort of asking you to come to it more than anything you know yeah and i and i was never able to project an image like the way some people could you know like i would i remember when i came out when i first came out there were all these there were some other songwriters like ryan adams and people and i would see him in a photo where he's got a cigarette dangling in front of an old typewriter or something. I couldn't do that. I, you know what I mean? And, and so I felt I was at a loss in how to project. I, I, or if I tried to do that, I would look like a total idiot, you know? So it was just sort of, I had to kind of go a diff, different route. Um, I went for a similar thing at points because I was in bands where I always felt like the front man thing was difficult because really I was just in my own head as a songwriter and just wanted to talk about you know I don't know dreams or little thoughts I've had so the skidding across the floor thing and making grand grand gestures was always quite difficult but I think something that I yeah. th you know th happened to me and I kind of hear in what you're talking about as well is that you end up getting comfortable with yourself don't you as who you are and as a writer and that's and that's you being authentic and that's enough oh yeah and I never wanted to be 
I, I want to be a good performer and I try, you know, like I never want to be the guy just standing there looking, looking at his feet. Cause I love all those guys like Freddie Mercury and Bowie and all, you know yeah. I mean? They just blow my mind what they can do. And like, they're yeah. just so they're larger than life, you know? Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but obviously you gotta know, you know, then you have people like Johnny Cash, who was just great. He just stood there. He was comfortable in his own skin. You know, that's what I try to get to that place or Dylan just always just stood there and sang. Yeah. So there's different ways to get it across. Um, and I've, you know, each year, the older I get, I feel a little more like, I know the people who are coming to see me, they're, they're not coming, you know, because I, I look like Brad Pitt or anything. You know what I mean? They're, they're coming to hear the, the music and they want, they're coming for a real experience. And yeah, Brad, think... Brad Pitt isn't real. I mean, I'm just saying. Yeah, you know, sure. Yeah. I hear so, that, but also it's quite interesting the people you name there, because if you think about Dylan and Bowie and Freddie Mercury, there's like, you know, Bowie obviously used characters and to some extent created versions of his character to present those, which is fantastic and, and amazing. I love him to bits. And Dylan, in a way, was quite kind of, you know, withdrawn and kind of, you know, would be abstract. And Freddie was just like massive performer with statement songs. But the reason yeah. I bring that up is that actually what you do is you are very honest and very uh, authentic and you're sharing your feelings. And that, you know, that that is just an honest statement so it's not you don't project a character or you know hide you are you are being really authentic and feeling what you're feeling in your songs and on stage and that and that requires want mm. to, to believe that as an audience member and as a listener you just have to believe that the person is giving you all of them right now and i think you do that wonderfully thank you and that's what um I mean, people, you know, every night, I'll, especially on this American tour, there, you know, I'd go out and say hi to folks after the show, and everyone seemed we was kind of saying things along on that line because I'm not aware of when I'm playing. I'm just I'm out, I'm usually freaking out backstage before every show because I know people have paid good money and they have babysitters, and I just want, you know, I want to do a good job, and um, so I just go out there every night and do my best, and but people seem to really appreciate. You know, there, so, you know, hearing something that there's no smoke and mirrors. You know, it's just that's, me up there. I mean. You know, yeah. and and so I, I guess I'm, you know, proud of that I can do that. You know, Definitely. all my heroes, all my heroes could do that. So, yeah. um, well, it's also like I think you know, you know, over it's 17 albums or 18 albums you you've created. You know, like I said, like a lot of your songs mean so much to me. And you know, I've spoken about not about to lose already, but. You know, we as fans of your music, um, and if you're a songwriter yourself, you have this for other artists, but we end up falling in love with songs, don't we? And they soundtrack our lives. And so the audience are coming to hear that song that, or those songs that they've fallen in love with, and it's your job to to give that to them. You know, there's that job role as an entertainer. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and I, that's the other thing, too. I mean, I know, you know, there are artists who will come out on stage and, they won't play any songs, you know, you know, like, yeah. and that's, I respect that too. You know, I'm just going to do my new album and that's all, whatever. But I, I just feel, again, people are coming to hear me and they have certain albums they like. And yeah. so lately I've been trying to play at least one from each record nice. to, you know, to hope, because I don't want someone going home saying, oh, I didn't play anything from or whatever it is. I mean, you can't yeah. play them all, obviously. I actually, I don't know if it was you, but I, I, I was looking through my requests for the, my London show and someone did request Not About To Lose. And, and I haven't played that one in a while. So it made me kind of like this week, I'm going to have to brush up on it and, and just see, you know, it's, it's one of those songs that I, I, I sometimes I never, th I think, oh, maybe it's not a good one to do by myself or something, but, but sure. I think I can. I think I can pull it off. It's just one of those, like, I mean, you've got so many of, of these because your melodies and you've been compa compared to, you know, by people like Elvis Costello and Daniel Lenoir have compared you to this. And it's true, like the, the kind of McCartney kind of level of melody writing. And you have that naturally in you. But that, that song, Not About to Lose, it, uh, you know, I guess it's just these things like I heard it on the radio, it stuck in my head first listen yeah. and it just stayed in my head. And it's, you know, you... I mean, you know, I've been listening to your stuff a lot over the last few days and it's, and it, you have so many kind of aspects of Ron that come across in your songwriting, some quieter stuff, some stuff which at times is almost like a whisper and then at times where it's harder and rockier. And then there's well, just like, you, sorry. Oh, no, no, I was just thinking about, I was reminded of the song Not About To Lose because that was a, a pivotal moment in my songwriting because before okay. I 
before I wrote that one, I hadn't really written very many choruses. Right. If you look at my early music, it's almost all refrains. Like there'll be a line that repeats at the end of the verse. But I was on tour with Coldplay. Okay. And and they were kind of blowing up. I was opening for them. And I would watch them every night. And I noticed that every time, every one of their songs at some point turns into this big chorus that the whole stadium can sing along to. Yeah. And I was thinking, well, I don't have anything like that. And I so I remember I was in like Phoenix or someplace in my dressing room writing Not About to Lose. And Chris actually knocked on my door and said, hey, what's that you're working on? Okay. I said, oh, it's this new song. And he goes, that sounds like a hit. And then he went on his way. And wow. and I so I was like, oh, maybe I'm on to something. But I, I really at that point with that song, I started thinking, not that every song has to have a chorus, but I, I started being more uh, aware of that. And, yeah. uh, you know. Well, actually, as a fan, like, I, I in a way, this is my own um, interpretation of this because we all do this with the artists we love. But it feels, I think of your, like, uh, albums as, like, everything before Retriever and everything afterwards. And to me, there is, like, a sort of difference uh, in... Maybe it's like that, the melody or the chorus thing or something, but it feels like there's a kind of like a, a line which sort yeah. of changes at that point. I agree um, with you, yeah. It's, do you, how do you think your songwriting is, I mean, you've given, a, given me an example there, but how do you think your songwriting over the years has changed? And do, do you look back and reflect upon albums or songs and, and do they influence your writing now? Or is it is it just like this batch of songs arrive and you just surf those songs? Um, yeah, I don't. I don't really go back too much to the early early records um, or any of them really. I mean, Retriever was kind of like a line in the sand for me because um, it was the first album where I thought I was I sang good. You know, my early album I was singing as good as I could or I was trying, but I was my voice was still kind of like a work in progress. Sure. Um, but you know, sometimes if I hear my first album, it's like. I don't, you know, a song like Secret Heart. Yeah. I don't even know if I would think to write a song like that now because I wrote that as a when I was still a courier and I was trying to simplify because I'd go to these open stages and there'd be people writing these songs that had eight verses, you know, like all this yeah, yeah. all these metaphors and things like that. And I wasn't good at that. And I um but that album for me, just the how it all turned out, working with Mitchell Froome. Um, I'm really, I'm really proud of those early records, but I, I was just like, again, I was still, I was, you know, I was on this big label and I didn't know how to make a hit record. And I was, I was trying, trying my best, but Retriever was, was an album I didn't even want to make because I was touring endlessly with opening for Coldplay from about 20, 2002 to 2003. And I was about to go home and my manager said, if you go to London, Martin Treffy has got a week off and he, you know, he could record your new songs. Right. And so I kind of went begrudgingly. Okay. And I told Martin, I go, you tell me what songs you want me to do. Cause I had about 30 of them and he put, he picked the songs that are on retriever. Okay. And I just remember once I started playing in the studio, the stuff I heard coming through the speakers was kind of almost like, what is going on here? Like I'm actually, happy with what i'm hearing for the first time <laughs> yeah and i and i just think that album yeah just really turned out you know in a, in a good way and i had two top uh 20 hits in canada and that never happened before sure. and that album opened up spain and germany for me in places that i didn't do that well in before so okay. uh, so i do think you're right that there it's pre-retriever and post-retriever albums you know yeah yeah it's 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 a sort of fascinating thing for like us fans to, well, to hear you say that did you know when you've written this is obviously as songwriters like all our songs that we write are kind of like our babies in a way and they have different strengths and they all deserve a position somehow but but sometimes they don't all make it through but are you aware when you've written a song which i guess i'm using the word great because that is subjective but when you when you write a great song or some let's put it down like this a song which really maybe becomes a radio hit or gets more radio play or just for whatever reason resonates more whether that's a not about to lose or whether that's um a secret heart or Strawberry Blonde, when you have those songs, are you aware that you've written one which that goes um, on to resonate more, or is it the same as every song? 
Yeah, you kind of have a sense that certain songs, for whatever reason, not that they're more special or something, but they do have an some like I remember writing a song called "Gold in the Hills," yeah, and uh, and that's become a, sort of one of my most requested songs. Yeah, but there was a feeling in the studio that was from Cobblestone Runway, that um, you know, this feeling like I I did something good, or <laughs> you know what I mean. I felt like it came together. Um, I don't know if I felt that when I wrote Secret Heart even, but there were certain songs along the way. And uh, and sometimes there's a song, you're not even sure if it's a good song, but you think, oh, this sounds like a single, you know, because yeah. sometimes yeah. The, the songs they pick for the singles aren't always the best songs on the record, but they're the ones, the most immediate songs. Sure, sure. Um, and, uh, you know, like Whatever It Takes from Retriever was did pretty well well for me, which was, wasn't even my favorite song on the album, but it was the first single. Sure. And uh, so, I mean, it's just, you know, they're all, like you said, there are kind of, there are babies and you're yeah. kind of like... Um, and also I find that when sometimes you write a song and, you, you, you know, you might write a little quiet thing or something just yeah. of its own being, and then... And along comes along comes like a really immediate song afterwards and you you recognize that like every song leads to another song and it's so important to just keep writing them because they sort of in a way impact the next song you know if you if you clear a feeling or clear a kind of uh song out of the kind of out of your head it makes space for the next one and and in a small kind of funny way they all inform each other don't they a bit you know yeah well that's that's what i you know like i said I try not to be a snob about it. You know, I'm yeah. writing, writing, and this song seems kind of goofy, but I'm going to finish it anyway, because yeah. sometimes that's the song, you know, that becomes the song, you know, that the radio plays, or that's the song that people want to hear. Um, you know, but but yeah, you, you, you just get it out of your system. And then, because yeah. uh, otherwise you're going to have sort of like a, a roadblock or something yeah, and yeah but i just write and um sometimes i'll write a song for that i think would be great for another person to sing but i can never you know they never end up doing it so i'll do it myself like there's many songs over the years songs like these days and foolproof from my blue boy record yeah. that i wrote for somebody else to sing i didn't even think i was the right person to do it um and you know, and I get a song that way, you know. Yeah, yeah. so sort of putting yourself, I love Foolproof, and it, sometimes maybe putting yourself, it's a, a good little technique is to imagine you're writing for someone else or, fe or feeling that feeling that the song might be for someone else because whether they do it or not, you've ended up slightly going into a different space, haven't you, as a writer? Yeah, and, and um, you know, the song Foolproof, I, I wrote that, I mean, it's funny because you know, I'd just been dropped by Interscope when I wrote that song. And I was thinking this was, I don't know, not 2000 or something. And I didn't know um, if I'd ever get another record deal. And I was at a basketball game watching my son play basketball. And I wrote the whole song in the bleachers watching him play wow. because I was thinking, well, maybe I should try to write a song for somebody. Okay. And I'd, I'd met Diana Krall a few times and I and she seemed really nice. And I thought, well, maybe I'll see her write something that maybe she would do. And I mean, she's never done it. But I wrote that whole song. I don't even know who won the game, you know, because I was just sort of concentrating on this <laughs> yeah. thing. And obviously it's written in a certain mode, right? It's yeah. written in a kind of standardy kind of thing. Yeah. And so I can do that too. You know, you can you can get wait for the ideas to come or you can be proactive and write something, yeah. you know, in a yeah. certain vein, you know, so. And, and when you have these, do you have, uh, do you run them past anyone else to, for like uh, reaction or not quality control exactly, but do you, do you kind of, um, do you go and play them live to see what the reaction's like or play them to Colleen or do you, do you have someone you go to to kind of uh, just sense their reaction and that might help, might make you decide whether to record it or not or is it just, do you make those decisions yourself? Well, Colleen's just around so I'm playing them to myself and every now and then she'll say oh that's a good one or or something yeah. um you know like on this new record um there's one song called diamond wave um that's actually really really old it's the only okay. song on the record that isn't a new song and um you know it's from 1988 wow. but i was just playing, messing around on it one day um on the guitar I, something reminded me of it 
and then she said hey that's a, what's that one that's really good and uh, was, but i was kind of surprised you know okay and so when it came time to demoing this new album i just threw it on there to see what the producer might think and he liked it too um in, in a weird way the lyrics sort of mean more to me now than they yeah. did when i wrote, when I wrote I it i think i think that happens with songs sometimes it's happened to me recently and and uh, has ha happened in the past where a song you write at the time you know it we always try to connect to the lyrics but later on down the line or something that the lyrics they're like almost like little prophecies sometimes that that you know come back and yeah. tell you what you're feeling now but you wrote them years ago you know yeah and then and so yeah so she'll say and i used to have some other songwriter friends that we'd get together and play each other our new songs and sure. you know and they would sometimes get really jealous oh, i wish i wrote that one or something like that you know but I don't really have a lot of people to bounce things off, except once I have a batch, the producer ultimately, you know, yeah. you know, well, they'll, they'll, they'll have an A list and a B list. And sometimes their B list is my A list, you know what I mean? So there's a bit of sure. tug of war sometimes when you're trying to pick the songs for a record. I watched Love Shines last night, actually. And obviously Bob Rock was uh, involved working with you and he brought something to the table, didn't he? In in a, in a way, and and all producers do. So, do you find like the having a producer to work with is um is a useful thing when you're picking songs or or arranging them or changing them around? Is that a good influence for you to have around? I, oh yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I've I've always worked with, with a producer. I mean, there was I guess uh, the Hermitage album. I you know I pr produced that one sort of with with Don Kerr. Yeah. But I don't really like the responsibility of being a producer. So I like to have someone in there who I trust and yeah. who's like Brad Jones had so many good ideas, uh, you know, every step of the way. At a certain point, I just said, t you know, you tell me what to do, because like, you know, with the m most of my albums, yeah, I, before I go in the studio, I've mapped it out how I want to sing a song with yeah. the harmonies and. Um, and so I would go out there and say, let me try this. And, and he would be like, oh, that's really good. But why don't you try this instead? You know, yeah. and his ideas were always, always better in terms of the like harmonies. And, sure. you know, um, so, yeah, and it's great to have a producer to bounce things off. Mitchell Froome, I learned so much from him in the early records about structure. He would be like, can we get to the bridge faster? Yeah. Can we use the bridge melody as an intro to the song? Can we, you know, all this kind of stuff that that's what a you know a george martin would do you know that's yeah, what a, a producer would do yeah, yeah. and sometimes i'd have a ballad and he'd say i think this would be a much better song if we sped it up you know yeah. a song like uh i had a song called summer blowing town on my first album which is one of my favorite songs on that record and that was i brought that in as a ballad or sometimes the key is wrong and mitchell would say i think your voice will sound better and if you bring it up a notch or something so yeah, I learned a lot of that stuff from him. Bob Rock worked the same way. He wasn't as musical as Mitchell. He was more of a you hear you know hear it sort of guy. But you know he would he uh, one thing he he said to me when we were working is listen to the Beatles songs like even there's their ballads their tempo they never drag it's just really Eleanor Rigby is faster than. I want to hold your hand or something, you know what I mean? So we made sure that all the tempos were were good. Yeah. And and also I, I he if I would sing a song, uh, you know, I'm set in my ways, he would say, Oh, come on, you know, we need a little more William Shatner here. We need some <laughs> more, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'd give him another pass that was a little more animated and sure, so, sure, so, sure. And so I've learned something from every producer I've worked with, and uh, but I would never want to be a producer myself. Yeah. No, it's a it's a different discipline, I think, and it's um you know I've done a bit of producing of other people, and you know to some extent we kind of my band produce ourselves, but I think like a masterer or mixing engineer or producer, it's a different discipline, and sometimes as songwriters we are in our own space as artists, and you just need someone else, don't you, to help to create the record? It's different. Well, yeah, and to tell me especially things with what the bass and the drum should be doing and yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, the groove and you know, whatever. Just to, what came across in love shines. Cause I, I love that when that came out and I appreciate you in a completely different state of being in different place in your life and career, but 
one of the things that comes across in that documentary is the, is the kind of um, quest which we all have as artists and writers to kind of be successful or to kind of to be appreciated in a certain kind of way and you know that seemed to sort of be a bit of a running theme through through that documentary now you're years away from that that documentary and that period of your life do you do you still have that kind of feeling of yearning for for that or has that now sort of dissipated into a kind of level of acceptance for everything you have and and, and are is it or is it still around or how do you feel about that now i don't um i think the movie may actually maybe focused a bit too much on that i mean it wasn't my movie sure. um originally it started off about me wanting to play massey hall and it somehow yeah. went back to this whole other thing and i wasn't uh you know in a down mood you know before i made that record because i'd i'd felt uh i was my career wasn't going anywhere and 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 i bob really helped me get through that yeah. but yeah at that time i thought i need to find someone who could help me connect you know because sure. the people were telling me fears oh i love your music and that well how come all these other people aren't getting it over here and i thought yeah. Here's Bob Rock, who I saw in the Metallica movie. Yeah, he seems like a nice guy. Lovely he guy, knows, yeah. you know, and he's had so much success. Yeah. And I remember I was at a party, and Michael Bublé was there, and Brian Adams was there, and Katie Lang. Everyone told me you should work with Bob Rock. Right. And so right. I, I just, I set out on this mission, and, um, you know, and it kind of worked, you know, in a way, you know, because that album was my most commercially successful record, and, and I'm not super pleased with all the auto tune and all that they put on it but sure. but that's kind of what radio was playing yeah uh, so so these days i don't i used to be very competitive you know okay. like with other songwriters oh you know i'd see what they were doing and i you know well david gray was doing really well oh i need to try to do something like that or you sure. know it never really informed my writing but just when right. it came time to make a record yes. i wanted to try to update my sound i didn't yeah. know how though. um i don't have those feelings anymore okay i don't yeah. i feel like i've kind of survived the record industry yeah I'm like i'm on the service road now of the yeah. you yeah. know i i always hope for the best with each record like you know i know when we released the first single from this album it went in ireland it went to number one or something you know That's and it got a lot of play in different places um but i i don't have uh other than trying to make the best album I can, I don't have, I, I hope for the best, I, and I don't have huge expectations, you know, that a 60, I'm almost 60 guy from Canada is going to light the radio on fire, you know what I mean? So uh, I'm just happy I got in the door when I did, and I have Absolutely. an audience. When you when you say service service, do you mean like servicing like your your kind of uh, fans and your and your gift? I do. I don't know what you call it in the UK, but you know the service road, like you have the highway, and yeah. then you have the service road along the side. You know, like the music industry is the highway, and I'm yeah. I was on that for a while trying to do that, but now I'm over here. You know what I mean? And that's all I meant. Because the music industry, the whole beast of the music industry, the whole, like, I mean, it is competitive and, you know, music and industry executives and management teams will try to, I guess, with best intentions, try to kind of get you to be a success. But it is a bit of a game and it can be very crushing on your soul when you're trying to just deliver what you want to deliver. And so to hear you speak about being in the service lane is is really great because really that's that's the place to be, isn't it, really, as, a, as an artist, I think. Yeah, I mean, I've met, you know, I mean, everybody's career has its own sort of trajectory, you know. Yeah. yeah. And I, yeah. I got signed, I was already 31 when my first album came out. So, mm. you know, I remember the label putting a sticker on my album saying I was 27. It was like so dumb. I'm like, well, <laughs> not a huge difference between, yeah. you yeah. know, and also it wasn't that kind of music anyway. Sure. Like, what does age have to do with it? And, um, mm. You know, and it's just, but but then you know, I go I, and I, I find this situation where I'm I'm meeting all my heroes and they're saying nice things and you know I headlined Royal Albert Hall that I never saw that coming. That's amazing. You know? And I, I so I do feel like I have had a you know a, a you know a success right in my career. Absolutely. I've had my songs covered by a lot of people Absolutely. and and I'm, I'm and I'm not 
you know, I haven't made insane amounts of money or anything like that, but I make a living and I own, you know, I own, bought my first house a couple of years ago. Amazing. So it's a very humble kind of existence. But well, it's, it's kind of actually massive. I mean, to be honest, that's, that's, I had to define what success meant to me a while ago. And it, and it was just what, what I boiled it down to was the, um, ability to carry on doing what you you, what you love, really. you love. And, and that's yeah. that's that's it in a nutshell because it's it's a, it is a strange choice to make in life like you said it's not the most financially reliable choice <laughs> and you and you know it, it is a very interesting journey so you have to be happy with what you're doing first and foremost don't you you have to be happy with being a songwriter writing songs that's the that has well, to be there oh it's huge you know i remember yeah, so many times when I was trying in my 20s, trying to get a record deal, being turned down by everyone in Canada, people telling me, oh, you know, basically pack it in. You know, I mean, my people who my friends and stuff telling me to pack it in because, you know, I had kids, you know, come on, it's, it's not it's not going to happen. Why don't you apply for a mailman job or something like this? Wow. And and I almost did, you know, because I was thinking, yeah, it's selfish of me to keep trying to sure. do this sure. thing. But I, I hung in there, and I'm really glad I, I did. Um, you know, and was that was was the love of songwriting the thing that kept you hanging in there? Was that was that was that the force that kept you hanging in? It was part of it, and also um, I just felt from a very early age, and this you know that it was it meant to be. You know, I mean, it's, yeah. you have these you hang on to any little shred of something, you know, like yeah. I was born on the same day as Elvis Presley, you know, for example. Yeah. And I was like, well, that's surely that has to mean something. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And all these dumb, all these things you kind of put uh, stock in, you know, uh, I don't know. I just felt, um, you know, and then I was gathering my own evidence in Toronto. Yeah. I would be playing the clubs. Yeah. I wasn't doing that well in Toronto, but the people who were coming to see me, were were seemed really into what I was doing. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, so yeah. I thought, well, I'm not crazy. I think these songs yeah. are good, and um, I just need to find the right person with ears, you know. And yeah. and and finally, I did. And but it happened in Los Angeles. Okay. And and you know, the record industry up here in Canada, when I got signed, there was a whole lot of backpedaling going on because for years they've been telling me I was no good, you know. So right, right. right. Um, I always feel even feel today a little bit resentful that they never really wanted me like Canada, my own country. And um, that's, I have to get over that at some point, but it's just like, um, uh, but I'm just glad I, you know, I found my audience initially. It was yeah. in the UK and Ireland and those places. And, but now it's pretty much everywhere in the world. I can go now and play and I have like this cult, you know, cult following. And, and that's, that's great, you know. I think uh, it's, it's 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 a very beautiful thing because it allows you to be you, and you know mm -hmm. the cult following are fervent about your songs, and that's you know obviously, a Massey Hall is uh you know of course you've done that a number of times, but that you know in the film it comes across that was a big one for you, and of that Neil Young album at Massey Hall is my favorite Neil Young album live at Massey well, Hall. It's a special place. Um, I'm actually trying. I don't know if it's going to happen, but next year I'm 60, and I, I wanted to do a show there called Sex Myth at 60. Fantastic. I don't know if there's any interest for that, but I'm, I'm you know, sure there would be. Yes, I, I'd like to think there would be, but yeah. So we'll we'll see. Well, that's on it's on my list of places to for us to play as well because it's got a special um, place in my heart. And uh... oh, well, I know that's what I was actually. I was just reminded. My very first tour was opening for this guy Robin Hitchcock. You know, Robin yeah. at all from. Yeah. And, and that's, I remember watching, I'd never heard of him and I'm watching him after my set. And this, and he had this every night, a small devoted crowd singing all the songs. And, and it was really interesting for me because I thought, oh, I could have a career like that. Yeah. You know, there's this guy, they worship him. Yeah. He's not playing stadiums or anything. And that was really good for me to see. And yeah. we're still friends. And, and that's basically the kind of career I ended up with too. Fantastic. But, it, you know, yeah. Fantastic. So, um, what, what advice would you give a songwriter starting out or actually any songwriter from your own experience of writing songs? What, what, if you were asked to give some advice, which I'm asking you, what would you, uh, what would you say to people? As... Well, obviously it's a whole different sort of ball game now with the music industry growing up. I, I it always seemed like I need to get a record deal or how else am I going to get my music? Out? But people can do it so many other ways now. Yeah. And, I'm not savvy that way, but people are amazing with their social media abilities and 
Um, but I, so I don't know about, about all that stuff. I don't have a lot of advice because I, I wouldn't know what to do if I was starting out now. Sure. But all I would, all I would say is, if if you're going to be a songwriter, it's good to know. I think it's good to know the history of it, yeah. And to do your homework, you know. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. it's also important to find your own way, you know, with a song. Obviously, I have so many influences and a hybrid of all these influences, but. I don't want um, to be ripping people off, you know, I want yeah. to be authentic. And so, you know, all it, uh, the way you sing, your point of view, it's all has to be a singular thing. Yeah. The way you play your instrument, you yeah. know, you could hear a Randy Newman song sung by Dusty Springfield, but you know, it's a Randy Newman song by the, the kind of the, his point of view and the kind of chords he's using. Yeah. Um, same with backrack, you know, you, you know, oh, that's a backrack song, right? For sure. Um, and so I think it's very important to, yeah, find that thing that people can't get anywhere else, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then you'll find the true believers, you know? And, yeah, um, yeah. but it's hard to do. And then, and, and you, and it kind of happens, you start off mimicking and trying to be sound like different people. And, and that's natural, you know, in the yeah. beginning. Yeah. But then at some point, it has to turn into this thing that that it's you. And otherwise, people won't believe it, you know. So. Yeah, I hear that. Identity, isn't it? It's forming your identity through your voice as a songwriter. And not oh. just your voice, but your your lyrical take and your perspective on the world. And and that comes, like you yeah. said, through we, we do mimic and we take bits and pieces from different people until we form our own thing. And that's... It's a kind yeah. of a osmosis effect. Yes, exactly. If you were to introduce your world, your songwriting world and your songs to someone who'd never heard you before, if I was to ask you to pick three songs which you'd offer up as a kind of uh, a path into your music or songs or three songs that you really feel you expressed yourself as a personal writer the best, I know I appreciate this is on the top of, off the top of your head, but what three songs would you kind of put forward as, as being kind of, you know, those songs? Um, well, uh, let me think. Well, I, I, I always thought, um, uh, you know, a song like former glory is one that, I, that I think kind of is, is something that you know I try to do. It's a hopeful song. It's a melodic song, and it's simple. You know, it's very simple language. So I think that song. Um, yeah, I mean, that's it. Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, but you know, again, getting, getting back to Retriever, I always thought uh, the song "I Know It Well" is one that that I mean, I hardly ever do it live, but it's probably my favorite on that album. Okay, because I just think it. It just came out so raw and and it said everything I wanted to say in that particular moment, you know? Yeah. Um, and I guess uh, Strawberry Blonde in a certain way. It's, sure. it's probably my most requested song. And it was really hard to write. It took me almost two years okay. because I didn't know how to end it. I didn't, I wanted to, I started off trying to write an impressionistic song right. in two verses. Yeah. where you get more of a, a feeling and I couldn't do it. And I felt like a failure actually in it, but it made me approach it more like a, like Charles Dickens or something okay. where I wrote this little, you know, little character story. Um, but I was, you know, I really pulled my hair over that one. And then, you know, like I said, I finally put it out feeling a bit like I'd failed, but when it's, you know, it's become, like I say, the song that I do kind of pretty much expect to do every night. Sure. And I'm, I'm I'm happy to do it, but it's, so I think those three songs off the top of my head. You know. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you for that. I'm really interested to know who were your early influences and who are your influences now? Where do you draw influences from? For, for, for my music? Yeah. yeah. Or for, for your lyrics or for your writing yeah. as a songwriter? Well... Obviously, you know, I have I still have my old favorites that I that I love, and you know, whenever Randy Newman puts out a new album, I, I don't need to hear it; I'll just go get it, you know, yeah, or yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. like that. Um, but I got to say, the guy that's kind of really um, come up for me, it, it, especially during the pandemic, was Warren Zevon. Okay, um, I always liked Warren Zevon, but I never really zeroed in on him. Right, and I just found again, it's that thing with his point of view. 
his kind of strange take on life and his sense of humor. Um, it, it made me feel heroic listening to his music during the pandemic. He has wow. this kind of bad boy kind of swashbuckling kind of thing. That's not me at all, but I just love, I just became, came to really love his music. And, and I went out, some of his albums are hard to find. So I have to go and order them from the record store and I would get so excited when they, they would show up. So he's someone that, uh, that, I think has influenced me actually. I don't think you would hear it as much in my music as you would like, you know, Ray Davies or something like that. Sure. Uh, so he's someone th that means a lot to me. Um, I've got into uh, Lowell George lately, cool. someone I, I, I was always aware of and, you know, but I never again took the time. And so recently I picked up his, uh, I think his only solo album and listening to that a lot. I remember in the early days when I first came out, some people compared me to Lowell George or Steve Miller and who weren't influences of me at all, but um, I liked them, you know. So so all these years later, I'm finally getting around to checking them out. Um, and the other guy is, uh, you know, Ry Cooter, you know. I, I really mm. like him. Yeah, yeah. And he, his last uh, series of albums are, you know, there's one called I Flathead. I guess it's already pretty old now. It might have been like 2014 or 20, I don't know what year it came out, but that album I listened to so much. I just thought it was, I mean, it's a very quirky album, but I just, I really liked his, it's almost like a, I think there's a, has a, has a concept album or something, but it's, it's hard to figure out what the story is exactly. But that album, I just really thought his, his lyrics were really, really nostalgic and sweet and funny and sad and all that kind of stuff. So, so those guys, I really uh, admire. And did you, and do you, as, as a writer, as, as a novel writer or as a musical writer, do, is, is reading important to you as a songwriter too? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 sometimes I go long periods where I'm not reading and then other times I'll read three or four novels or something in a row. I mostly mm -hmm. like, like, you know, fiction. Okay. Um, but I also I'm a sucker for a good music bio, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, like yeah, the George Jones one, or I read, uh, yeah, I read a couple on Warren. I've read a great one on Nielsen, a really really thick one. Yeah, so I like I like that, and I think it is important um, if you have time. I mean, sometimes if I'm writing a lot, I don't want to read anything. You sure. Know? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Um, Nilsson's quite a big influence thing because I, I didn't know that before talking to you, but um, I yeah. can hear that actually in your writing. It's um, oh yeah, yeah. He's he's a, um, was an amazing songwriter. Amazing he's such writer. a kind of mysterious guy in a way, but I I always loved knowing that he was in the world. Um, I spent a whole evening once in the Roosevelt Hotel in Hollywood because T Bone Burnett told me Harry Nelson was going to call me. And I just was sitting by the phone, waiting for him to call. And he never did. The phone rang a few times, but it was somebody else, you know. And then I called T-Bone back and he said, oh, I, he's not, he, you know, he, he was pretty sick at the time, Harry Nielsen. Sure. But he said, next time you're in town, I'll try to set it up where you guys could meet in person. And then he, then he died, you know. So it was just one of those not to be you know kind of things i guess it's so, like i think with someone like him because he's obviously was a big character and uh, had a beautiful long career but also it was obviously like alcohol was a thing and he was a bit of a rogue but the, but within that there's all this big romance isn't there and huge feeling and huge heart in his writing yeah and and you see uh watch the documentary the people the people he hung out with just loved him you know he was very magnetic he was yeah. he was fun I mean, obviously, you know, yeah, he dealt with a lot of issues and he kind of had a death wish too. I think yeah. he yeah. he wanted to put his body through everything, you know, everything, every drug, every drink. Yeah. And and I think, in, you know, and, it, and he, you know, he blew his voice out, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But I just felt for me like, you know, he, he just, 
you know, like there was a song called Think About Your Troubles that whenever I'm down, I just put that song on and he puts everything into perspective. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. like a friend and I yeah. felt, it felt like a friend. And I, even though I never got to meet him or anything, his music is like a friend to me. And Well, that's, and, that's how it is. I think with songwriters, I mean, you know, I was speaking to my daughter about it the other day and she was, you know, just at, at a moment as we all do, just feeling a bit lonely or lost or whatever. And, um, you know, the Beatles were a huge influence on her growing up and for me as well. So if ever I'm feeling uh, in need, you, I put my best friends on who are, who are the Beatles or I put you on at a certain point when I need you as a best friend or anyone else. And that's that's the kind of loveliness of, of the world of songwriters. That even if we don't know them, we do through their words and music. Well, yeah, and it's, it, it's deep, you know, because it just makes, you know, you put a record on and, it's, I, you know, I, and it's like it's someone that's art been is able to articulate whatever you're going through, and yeah. he doesn't even know you, or she doesn't even know you, and yeah. and it's it's an amazing thing, and and from all over the world, you know, you people listening to the the same music is affecting people, you know, and um, and it's especially magical when you know when when it's um when you hear like the way that songs come to you which is often they'll turn up in your head and you, you know the yeah. fact that there is this force that delivers these things and then they become best friends to someone else and you know as as much as our career as songwriters is about us uh getting somewhere or putting something out or doing the hard work of making a record there's also it's also a real joy isn't it to be a songwriter and to and to have that relationship with an invisible creative force it's a it's a real labor it's a joy and labor of love i think yeah and it's an honor to you know to make a record and to know that there are people who are excited about it and they yeah. want to hear it yeah. and they want to put it on in their however they listen in their headphones or whatever they do yeah, and and you know because when I, i'm like that with any record especially if it's by a record that by someone that I really admire. If you haven't, if they haven't put out an album in a while, it's like hearing from an old friend and you want to know how yeah. they're doing and you yeah. want to know what yeah. they're going through yeah. Yeah. or how they view what's going on in the world. So, and there's, there's a trust uh, that is formed. And um, even if they, not every record you're going to love as much as the last or whatever, you know, but there's still a thing that, you you know that they're really into it. Whatever, you know, Neil Young's made so many records. Yeah, yeah. And not all of them are great, but you know that every time he was making a record, he was really into it at the time. And and then he moves on, right? Because, you, you know. There's always a... I mean, with Nick, just in Neil, for example, his, his album he put out, Barn, um, there's a track yeah. on that. Called, I think it's called... Um, it's not the same. I think it's yeah. called that. And you just, it's a crazy horse thing where you, they they do that crazy horse thing for like this long song. And, and yeah, they, they jam, yeah. yeah, and you get that thing where great, uh, the artists that you love, it's kind of like being a football fan or a hockey fan, like you go to every game and, you know, whether they win or lose, you're going to turn up and you and you love that team, you know, you love that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you just like to see, oh, he's playing with his friends, he's playing music with his friends and yeah. life is, you know, I mean, they're not going to be around forever, these people, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, um, let me ask you a few more questions. Just a few yeah. more questions, and thank you very much for your time. And you know, anyone out there who's listening to this podcast, I really recommend you deep dive Ron Sexsmith and his new album, The Vivian Line, is absolutely wonderful. Um, so people who can see you on tour and and go and buy the album, and you absolutely should if you haven't got it already. Let me ask you this question: um, Do you ever co-write? And if so, what do you gain from a co-writing situation? Well, I mean, I have I, I have a sort of no co-writing rule for my own albums. Yeah. Because yep. I like to look on the back and it says all songs written by yes. Ron, you know, like the same way all songs written by Lightfoot or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I um, but I don't have a, I have co-written, um, you know, with different people. Leslie Feist, we wrote a song called Brandy Alexander. That's the only time I have had a co-write on one of my albums, actually, was that song it's on Exit song. Yeah. And, um, and and there was a period where my publisher was flying me everywhere to meet with writers to write. You know, you're in a room with somebody you never met. It's a bit awkward, and yeah. you try to write a song, and hopefully, maybe someone will do it. I didn't have a whole lot of luck doing that. So I find these days, um, uh, if I have to co-write, if someone sends me some music and and they need lyrics, I can do that. Yeah. Or vice versa. Someone, it's easier to write music to lyrics, obviously, than sure. the other way around. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've done it enough times. It's 
and I've had really good experiences and I've had some really bad experiences. There's sometimes where I've written to someone and I, where I feel like I'm done all the work yeah. and then yet they still want to split a 50, you know, 50, 50. Yeah. And I say, okay, fine, whatever. Um, but, and so the, it's, it's, it's weird, you know, cause I, or sometimes I'm, I'm like a song doctor, a, a person will come to yeah. me with their song yeah. and I don't actually do any writing, but I'll say, Oh, well, all you need to do is repeat that part and that unfinished verse, just turn that into a bridge. And then, you know, or something like that. It's like a puzzle. Yeah. So, so, um, but yeah, for my own albums though, I've tried to, I've tried to avoid, avoid that. I mean, I, I made a whole album recently with my, one of my best friends, Kurt Swinghammer called uh, Sex Miss Swinghammer Songs that we wrote for his partner, Laurie Cullen, to sing, where he wrote all the music and I wrote all the lyrics. So it was like a Backrack and David kind of thing. Nice, nice. And that was a real fun challenge for me because he writes it with really interesting uh, time signatures and things like that. Um, yeah, so I can do it when I put my mind to it, but I prefer to write by myself. Cool, man. And so do, have you got the next sort of batch of songs arriving for your next record? Is that kind of I happening do. right now? Yeah, I do actually. Uh, on this last trip in the dressing room, usually before the show, I have my, my laptop with a file of all my new songs, like just the lyrics. So I, every day I, I go through them all. And as you're going through them, that's when I do my tweaking, you know, because I'll be going, oh, that word doesn't sing very well. And I'll try another word. Oh, yeah, I don't need this verse or, well, you know, that kind of stuff. So yeah. I do that every day and I'm basically I'm getting them to the p point where pretty soon I'll be able to go in and demo them. Yeah. And yeah. and then once you demo them, you can that's when you start, you know, because every album I've made, I usually demo oh sorry, the phone's ringing. I usually demo them about four times, right? Sure. Sure. Like, can I just let that ring? <laughs> um uh, you know, so I'm at getting to the point where I'll be about ready to demo them uh pretty soon, I think. Yeah. Cool. And do you ever play a kind of song which isn't quite finished, but you are excited about it? Do you ever risk and just play it live just to see what happens? Uh, I think there have been times where I would say, hey, I'd like to try out this new song or this on. But um, I can't remember doing that recently, though. I mean, I feel uh, even this new album, uh, I was on tour last year. And I had, a, obviously, the album was finished. I was touring my last album, but I didn't play anything from it because I didn't okay. want to let the yeah, sure. cat out of the bag. Yeah. Although when the first single came out in September, then I was fun to have this new song to play, you know. But, um, I, you know, I have local friends here. If we're hanging around and I'll play them, hey, check this new song out, you know, and or something. And that happens. Um, but, but at the moment, I... Almost every day I, I run through, I think there's 12 of these, 12 songs. Great. I run through them and try them in different keys, try them on the piano, try them on the guitar. And and that's kind of what I do with every album. I, I try them every which way until I feel like you it's it. it's right, you know. And, uh, I think that's so important. That's one of the things we do is, is making sure, is like getting them in the right key and the right tempo is doing that groundwork is, is so important before you make a record. Just so, so they get to become themselves you know you've got to do that work haven't you yeah no for sure ron thank you so much for your time and let me ask you um one last question if if i may yeah. um which i appreciate will change from day to day but it's a question i asked everybody on this podcast um if you could have written any song in the history of songwriting what song would you have liked to have lived with and lived inside and what song would you have liked to have written oh man um You know, and this is a song you may not, you probably won't be familiar with, but um, there's an album by a jazz artist. He's dead now, named Jack Teagard, and he was a trombonist, but a, a great singer, like not a technically great singer, but a kind of like a character kind of singer. And he made an album in 63 called uh, Think Well of Me. And that song, the title track, Think Well of Me, I just wish I, I could have the song is so beautiful and it's short the lyrics are just very wise and and beautiful and i keep 
uh, you know, that's I've been learning it too because it's got some tricky chords in it. But I've been sort of playing that lately to myself and wishing, oh, I wish, wish I could have written this song. It might be on YouTube. I mean, I have it on vinyl, but I don't know. I'm, I'm sure it's out. But it's called, yeah, it's called Think Well of Me. And yeah, anyway, uh, yeah. Thank you very much, mate. And, and I really love your new album and, and you know, love all your work. So thank you so much for being my guest today on the podcast. And good luck yeah. with the tour. And um, I can't wait to hear the next set of 12. And thank you so much for your time. Beautiful. Thanks. See you soon. Take, Take care. care mate. Bye-bye. Yeah, Bye.